So here we are in this holy Saturday, the day in which we await the resurrection of Jesus after having contemplated his Last Supper and his Passion. It feels like a whirlwind of so many things and now we get to this quiet time uh, in the middle of the storm, things quiet down and we live in expectation. And it's very unique to live this Holy Saturday on this time of the pandemic in which uh, how we feel also parallels how the disciples must have felt. Uh, they, they were in expectation, they were um, locked in fear, uh, they were awaiting uh, what would happen next. Uh, some maybe had lost hope, but many were ex in expectation. Um, and so I think, like, I think that the situation we are living right now mirrors a lot of the situation of the Holy Saturday. We are in some way living as a sort of extended uh, Holy Saturday right now. Um, and I think this also um, harkens back to a time that Israel lived through. It's a time of exile, you know, um, when they were conquered by uh, powerful empires and they were exiled to Babylon. And for 70 years, Israelites lived, were you know, sent to those foreign lands and they were missing their temple and their land and their worship. Uh, and they were always in um, kind of nostalgic and looking forward to the day they would be able to go back to the land of Israel. Um, they were, if you want, they were deprived of sacramental signs. They were deprived of the signs of the presence of God in, in those years. But they were not deprived, as we are not deprived today, of the presence of God. We know that God dwells in our hearts, that He is with us, that He watches over us. We're not deprived of the presence of God. We know that He can act in us, but we are deprived of the signs of His presence and the presence uh, of Christ in the community, in the sacraments, in that common prayer and worship. And, and that's not an unimportant thing. I mean, we need those signs of the presence of God in our lives. Uh, it's really hard to focus and to pray well without any signs. And I think we are discovering that very much uh, these days as we go through this time of isolation. I think this leads us, I mean, leads me to at least to reflect on how wise God is, how He, you know, He has used our bodies, our senses, our visible signs as a way to manifest spiritual things. Uh, and think of it, always, whenever God reaches out to us, He uses sensible signs, things that we can see and smell and touch. Um, he, he decided to manifest His invisible glory becoming incarnate, taking on a body. He decides, He has decided to sanctify us and to work in our souls through material things like water, bread, wine, oil, you know, and, and all the signs of the liturgy, like music, investments, and movement, and people praising around us and singing together. So, um, you know, that's because we are body and soul. We are a body and soul unity, and we, we function better that way. And because we function as a body-soul unity, that's why God decided to reach out to us in this visible way. Um, think, for example, how, how the body is an instrument of the Spirit. Uh, our faces, our, our ex facial expression, convey so much of the soul. And that's why, you know, animals normally don't have much variety of facial expression, but hum a human face ex conveys so much. The eyes, the tone of voice, the gestures, you know, the way we look at things. Uh, human, a human face is so expressive of the Spirit. And, and that's because we're this body and soul unity. And that, that's, you know, accordingly, God wanted to connect with us being spirit, he wanted to connect with us in this very visible way. Um, so I wonder, as many people wonder, why, why we go through this time in which we are, yeah, not deprived of the presence of God. We know that God keeps watching over us and loving us as the one who sustains us and, and, and wants our, our salvation and, and cares for us. But why are we deprived of these signs that we need so much? to perceive His presence or His words to us. And I think it's a, it's, it's a time of purification 
just like it was for Israel, the time of um, the time of exile. It was a time of learning other kind of other ways of experiencing God's presence or other ways of perceiving His providence. Um, they were purified through that time. You know, uh, I love this prayer of, in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, the prayer of Azariah. They, he wrote the following. We have in our day no prince, prophet, or leader, no burnt offering, sacrifice, oblation, or incense, no place to offer first fruits to find favor with you, but with contrite heart and humble spirit let us be received as though it were burnt offerings of rams and bulls, or tens of thousands of fat lambs. So what Azariah, what the prayer in the book of Daniel is saying, is that Israel had to learn uh, in the time in which they had no temple, no worship, no visible signs of the, of the worship of God. They had to learn um, to seek God in the meditation of the word of the scriptures. They had to seek God in the purity of the heart. In a sense, that led them to some sort of introspective revision of who they were and, and to discover that they had to learn how to worship God with less signs, but that would then purify their hearts to worship God visibly in a better way when they came back to Jerusalem. In a, in a sense, it was a sort of being cleansed from within, being transformed, so that then they would be able to come together again and, and express their, their common worship in a, in a better way. And I think something like that is what's going on right now. I can imagine the disciples on Holy Saturday, they must have reflected so much on what happened the prior days. And, uh, you know, they had no gathering of many disciples. They didn't have Jesus physically present with them. They were mostly in silence in the quiet of their homes and they were reflecting on all the things that happened the prior days, all that Jesus did, the miracles, the things that he said. They were reflecting on that, that crazy Holy Week uh, of Easter that uh, when Jesus was anointed by Mary in Bethany, when he was arguing with the Pharisees, then what happened at the Last Supper and all those mysterious things that Jesus did with giving them his body and blood. And what that meant and then the next day the crucifixion and they were pondering all these things they were like Mary you know reflecting what what does it mean it happens so fast now we need, we need time to process and assimilate it and I think this Holy Saturday is a time to do that it's a time to since we don't have many external signs we cannot gather together we don't have all the visibility of the sacramental signs with us it's a time for us to reflect. And I th this, this, I think, is perfectly um, explained and, and kind of unfolded by, in a sermon by John Henry Newman, by St. John Henry Newman, called Christ, uh, The Presence of Christ Manifested in Remembrance. And Newman says in that sermon um, that there's a sort of law of God's providence that we see in, in the Bible that uh, and that he revealed in his own person that um, God gives us words or, or gestures that come from him but they're not understood in the very moment but rather later when you reflect on, on, on them you know um, he for example he came to the disciples in the person of Jesus he, he became incarnate but they would not grasp exactly who he was until later and all that his present meant in the world until later so um, Newman says, you know, that God's presence is not discerned at the time when maybe the thing, the revelation happens, but it's uh, better understood afterwards. Um, and that's, for, for example, why you may remember that just on Holy Thursday, Jesus was washing the feet of the disciples and he said to Peter, what I'm doing, you will not understand right now, but later on, you will understand it. Um, as if this was a sort of law that, you know, they were, they were to receive certain words or gestures, but they wouldn't grasp the significance of them in the moment. But reflecting upon them later, then they would understand. Uh, I can imagine that now, you know, Peter, John, James, Matthew, they, were, they would all be remembering what happened the prior days. 
and all these dots would start to connect in their minds. And all the phrases that Jesus said in the light of his crucifixion and his promise of the resurrection, they would start to take on new significance. I'm sure the word still a bit startled by the whole thing, but you know, they were starting to make a deeper sense of what they had experienced. And something, you know, further on, I, I kind of follow along Newman's sermon that I encourage you to read as part of this exercise today. Uh, Newman goes along to say that this doesn't only happen in, in the revelation of the Bible, but also happens in our personal lives. Many times God reveals something to us in our lives and it doesn't click completely in the moment, but it starts to unfold later all the significance that it has. Uh, so, for example, we may not see the hand of God in daily events that happen to us or, or world events that happens to us like this one, but you know, maybe a year from now we'll be able to more fully understand what this whole pandemic situation meant for our life together, for us as a society, as a church and also personally. Um, you know, you may also look back at events in your own life and realize that now, the, the, how providential those things were. And maybe at the time you didn't quite think anything of it, you know, but maybe you, if you think of the times, the school you went to, the people you encountered when you were young, the mentors you had, the teachers that made an impact on you, those profound words that were given to you by your grandparents or your father or your mom, um, and now in the distance they start, you know, they kind of shine and they, um, they are highlighted in your memory as something that was very, very important for your upbringing on your formation. But right now, right at the moment, I mean, uh, they didn't quite seem as, um, as significant. Um, he, Newman also goes on to say that uh, uh, even sorrowful times, even times of cross or challenges, which at the time seemed simply like a, being you know, a privation or, a, or a suffering. Uh, when you look back upon them, you realize there, were, there was so much of God in them. You, know, you, you grew, you, uh, your vision was expanded, you started to appreciate things differently. Right? Uh, so the wisdom that God intended to give you from that suffering or that cross didn't come to you all at once, but it comes, it comes to us uh, after reflection, after some time. Again, okay, and a final um, element that Newman highlights, and I think I like to especially dwell a bit more on this one, is that um, when you, it says, when you look back on your younger years and your childhood, uh, there's a certain glow that comes with it. Uh, but Newman says it's not so much because you are nostalgic, but rather because you discern you now discern the presence of God in them. And I like to quote what he says in that, in that little section. Newman says, I'm quoting, they, um, people who remember back, right, they are full of tender, affectionate thoughts toward those first years, but they do not know why. They think it is those very years which they yearn after, whereas it is the presence of God which, as they now see, was then over them, which attracts them. So he's saying, you know, they think that they are nostalgic about those years of, you know, my childhood, my, the home I grew up in, the, the first school I went to, you know, those, you know, moments in the living room with my parents. They think it's simply going back to, to those, to what it feels like home. But Newman says, uh, it's not just, just a nostalgic feeling of your childhood. It's, it's because then you were, uh, for the first time, you discovered goodness, love holiness, the presence of God, you know, when you were first walk into the chapel or, receive, or you receive uh, First Communion. And keep, keep going on with Newman here. They think that they regret the past when they are but longing after the future. It is not that they would be children again, but that they would be angels and would see God. They would be immortal beings crowned with amaranth, robed in white, and with palms in their hands before his throne. I love this. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? Uh, so he says, you know, um, because at times we perceive the presence of God more clearly in how he touched our souls in the past, when we look back upon those years of first discovering something about, you know, his holiness and so on, they glow, those ears glow with a special, 
shine, but it's not simply that we are just want to go back and be children again. Rather, we are looking towards the future when we'll see God face to face. Like that, those memories awaken a sort of expectation for the future, and I find this to be so amazing dynamics in our in our how our minds work and how our spirits work. God sows something in a certain moment in our lives, and that sort of comes to full fruition or um, flowering in in time in, upon reflection. And then at that moment, you look to the future, you look to the moment when you will be more in more in a closer union with God. Isn't the, it this Holy Saturday? Um, they might, rem, you know, disciples might remember Mary, our mother, must have looked upon the, all that happened with Jesus on the cross and all that she experienced from her son. But then that led her to look forward to the future to the resurrection, to, to glory. Um, I wanted to share with you a testimony also that I read in this book. I've been reading this, uh, the, the Great Discovery. It's a story of uh, a pastor of a mega church in Sweden who became Catholic in 2014, Ulf Ekman and, and his wife, Brigitta Ekman. Uh, and I'm not going to comment much on the book and their conversion story, but rather a sort of backstory they tell inside the book. Uh, they're telling when they were, for a season in their lives, uh, they, were, they were pastors of this huge church in Sweden that trained pastors to go and evangelize all over the world. At a given time, they had like a network of about 200,000 Christians who kind of relied on the formation and the guidance they, they imparted in their church in Sweden. So there was a time in their lives in which they were living in Jerusalem. They wanted to go closer to the sources of Christianity. They were living there for a time. And they had a Swedish secretary who happened to be living in, in Jerusalem. But she, was, uh, she had lived for a time in Sweden. Uh, her name was Abigail, okay, with, with, a, uh, with a V. And, um, okay, so they were going to other places. And one of the places they, they entered in was a mon the monastery of Bethlehem, this uh, French order that also has a house monastery in the Holy Land, and they are an amazing monastic community of women. So they, they tell how the, the three of them, Ulf and Brigitte and the secretary Abigail, walked into the chapel from a balcony and they looked down and they saw something on the altar that looked like a sun. It was a monstrance with the Blessed Sacrament, and just one only, uh, a nun kneeling on the floor and adoring what was on the altar. They didn't quite understand exactly, but so they, they say um, a monster stood on the altar and we understood that the nun was worshiping the Lord in the sacrament. We had recently read about this and began, had begun to understand that it was a great and precious treasure. I saw that Abigail, Ulf's secretary, leaned toward the railing of the loft and looked intently at the nun and the monstrance. Tears ran down her cheek cheeks. Ulf also noticed this and we realized that something had happened in Abigail. So they, later they say, when we came home again to Ain Kerem, Abigail told us, listen to this, it's very moving, that when she saw the sister before the altar, she saw herself as though in a flash as a little girl at home in the United States. She had grown up there with a Catholic mother and when she was little, she had loved the nuns and dreamed about one day becoming one of them. But in her early teens, she had left her faith and lived many years without contact with her Christian faith until she had had a renewed experience of God when she was 30 years old. So way later. But this time in a Baptist setting. She went along on different paths and eventually ended up with Word of Life in Uppsala. That's their church in, in Sweden. She had suppressed her Catholic background and instead asserted that one of her parents was also a Jew. So she was you know, a lady that had a very complex background and, and, and uh, went to so many places. So this drew her to Israel. And after two years of Bible school in Uppsala, she emigrated to Israel. When we eventually moved there, we had met her again and she became our secretary. Okay, so... Um, just an illustration, but this I found somewhat similar stories in different settings of people who, um, like Abigail, uh, and by the way, later on, I cannot let you know in the story that she becomes, eventually becomes a Catholic and becomes a nun 
in that monastery of Bethlehem. So now she's Sister Abigail Marie um, in the monastery of, of, uh, of Bethlehem. But um, it's amazing how it's, it's happened to many people that suddenly God touches their hearts and they have this flashback. They remember something that was a sort of message from God in their early years of their lives. Something happened to them very young in which they recognized that this was God talking to them or, or, or helping or opening their eyes, their minds to some holiness and beauty that is not of this world. And then that they forget about that, that prayer that they uttered or something that happened, they kind of remains buried inside. And there's a moment in which God brings it up again. And they suddenly remember, yes, I, I once felt this. I once saw this very clearly. And it's very moving because in a way it's a secret that only, only, only they and God know. Uh, and they recognize well, the hand of God in this. Isn't it amazing how it happens? So at times God will manifest something, uh, the significance of something he wanted to show when you remember back. Or he will reveal something about your life when you remember back one of those key moments. Well, I'm not pretending that this exercise today is going to be a sort of <laughs> maybe the revelation moment in your life. Maybe it will be, I don't know. Uh, but for many of us, it may be simply a way to gain deeper wisdom. So what I invite you to do on this uh, meditation today is the first, of, first of all to read the sermon by John Henry Newman, Christ Manifested in Remembrance. Just an amazing sermon. The, the language, the English is a bit complex, longer sentences, but it's a great read. I will put the link down here and also have it in the, in the handout. And as a first step of the exercise, I would like you, well, I'm just explaining the, what you found written there. Um, draw a timeline of your life and maybe mark some of those key moments in which God manifested himself to you. Maybe first experience in school or something that happened in your family, your first prayers, um, receiving the sacraments, someone you met, some people, a group or community that was very significant to you. So signal those moments or, or periods in your life that were kind of laden with the presence of God. Okay, And then take, I would say, one or two of these. Uh, I suggest maybe take one of, one of those early memories and also one of something more recent, something that maybe happened this past year, uh, and, and describe it. Try to enter into that moment and, and maybe write down what it meant for you, how God dis disclosed His glory, how He showed you something about yourself and what you're longing for and what you're needing. Um, and then as a final step, uh, pray. Okay, Pray to God, give Him thanks, praise Him, uh, express, you know, the back to the Lord, the, the things you've discovered about Him and about yourself in that recollection. And you can conclude this prayer with the, uh, that prayer of Azariah in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 26 through 45. So I hope that this uh, exercise of memory, of remembering, uh, will connect you with the situation of the disciples right after the Passion. They were also kind of remembering and drawing wisdom from all the things that had happened to them so quickly and, and trying to connect the dots, but also will help you gain wisdom uh, of what, what's been happening in your own life, especially as we have more time for recollection in these holy days and in this whole situation. So may God bless you in this uh, preparation for the resurrection of the Lord, this very unique Easter, and give you the wisdom that, that you're looking for.